Welcome everybody to Gardening for the Environment. I am Dean Gunderson, the Director of Education here at Seed St. Louis, and we're going to jump right in. <clears throat> so um, a lot of times when people are thinking about gardening, the idea is just kind of that, you know, gardening in and of itself is a sustainable thing. And in a lot of ways it can be, um, but it really depends on kind of how you garden, how sustainable it is. So growing your own food can be great for the environment, but only if you actually eat it, which, you know, seems obvious, but um, only if you're actually eating the stuff that you're spending all of that time and resources to grow. Um, and also only if you're growing it in a way that doesn't use a ridiculous amount of resources to produce it. So like if you're, you know, constantly irrigating and buying in all of these exotic things from all over the planet that are, you know, shipped across the seas to get to you and all of that to get like a tomato, it's probably not actually all that sustainable. But <clears throat> growing uh, food in our garden in a sustainable way and actually eating it can be a huge, a huge benefit for the environment because currently 40% of the food produced in the United States is actually never consumed. And that's where, again, where I'm going back to if you actually eat it. 40% um, of all the food produced in this country is never consumed. It is thrown away and like not consumed by anyone, like not consumed. Um, <clears throat> and most of that ends up being sent to a landfill where it turns into methane and goes into the atmosphere and does all sorts of nasty stuff. Uh, the USDA estimates that the amount of food waste that we produce in this country is equal to the emissions of about 42 coal power plants. So if we just stopped wasting all of our food, which is much easier said than done, but if we just stopped wasting all of our food, it'd be like just shutting down 42 coal plants. Um, <clears throat> and this is a lot of what we'll be kind of talking about today. Kind of how do we how do we make it more efficient? How do we actually use the food that we're growing? How do we use fewer resources um, in what we're in what we're doing and how do we garden in a way that is also um, hopefully constructive to the local environment and not just less bad. So some of the keys to sustainable gardening are uh, to kind of plan your garden in a way that makes it easier to use this food that you're hopefully going to be harvesting. Um, and one of the first things I always tell people is to plan your garden and to grow what you actually eat, which again, sounds pretty obvious, but um, as gardeners, uh, I know I am like this, and I'm sure many of you are. Um, I like to experiment with stuff. I like to grow lots of weird things or like this one would be fun to grow and I'll grow it and I'll plant a whole bunch of it. And then it turns out I don't like it. And then I don't really eat it. Um, so it's definitely okay to experiment because that's how we find new things. But for the most part, what you should be growing is stuff that you know that you're actually going to eat um, so that you're actually getting something, you know, that you can eat from your garden and that you know you will want to eat and not just something that you hope will be fun. It's also helpful to uh, stagger your harvests. So there's a couple ways to do this. Um, and what I mean by that is just that you have um, a crop coming in, hopefully not just all at once. So just a perfect example of that would be kind of the difference between like collards and cabbage. They're both brassicas. They're actually the exact same species. Um, you're eating the leaves on both of them. But collards, you know, you harvest a couple leaves every week for like 10 months. Whereas cabbage, you get ahead one time. Um, and that can be okay, but a lot of times, most what most of us do is we plant all of our cabbage at the same time. And so then we get, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 heads of cabbage, like in a two week span. And what are you gonna do with that? Unless you really like sauerkraut. Um, it's not something that's easy to use quickly. And so a lot of times it can go bad. So if you grow things instead like collards, um, it's much easier to kind of keep up with that production and for that production to happen for a longer time so that you're not having the situation where like, you know, if you really like cabbage, you plant it, you get a whole bunch of cabbage and for maybe a month or so, you're eating cabbage out of your garden. But then if you want to keep eating cabbage, most of us are still going to the grocery store and getting cabbage versus if you're growing collards or kale or something like that, that you can keep harvesting. You can basically eat from your garden for that crop for a long part of the year. So for things that, that do harvest kind of all at once, like cabbage, another 
thing um, to look at would be uh, succession planting. So that would be if you have a crop that produces all at once, that what you can do is you can plant, you know, if you were going to grow 20 heads of cabbage, let's say, um, which is a lot of cabbage, but let's, you know, let's assume we're going to do 20 heads of cabbage. Um, instead of planting all 20 heads of cabbage on the same day, you plant five heads of cabbage one week, and then the following week you plant another five, the following week you plant another five, the following week you plant your last five. Um, and then because you're planting them about a week apart, you can usually expect to be harvesting them about a week apart. And so your harvest is then gonna go from kind of producing all in like a one to two week period into like a four to six week period, which is again, much easier to actually consume all of that food so that it's not um, rotting or going to waste or, or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and part of that staggering harvests, um, and I you know touched on this a little bit, but would just be picking crops that would produce over a longer period. So kind of a classic example of that would be growing leaf lettuce instead of head lettuce. Um, so they both kind of taste the same, at least in my opinion, um, but leaf lettuce, it's much easier to keep um, to keep harvesting leaves for a longer period. You just kind of come and pluck some of the leaves off versus a head lettuce, you know, you kind of let it produce a head and then you harvest that head and then that's all you got and that plant is done. Or growing pole beans, which are the vining bean, um, those will actually produce over several months Whereas bush beans, <clears throat> the ones that stay really short, will generally produce a whole bunch kind of all at once, and then you know take a couple weeks off, and then a whole bunch all at once, and then take a couple weeks off, and then a whole bunch um, all at once. Um, and they were bred for that purpose. So you know things like bush beans um, and broccoli and cauliflower were actually developed not for home gardeners but for market farmers because it's much easier to have something that produces all at once that you can load up onto your truck and drive into the city and sell than it is to have something where you have to pick and sell every single week for nine months. Uh, it's a lot easier to have something that you kind of harvest all at once and you can truck into the city and sell it and then kind of be done for a while. <clears throat> and then also growing varieties or cultivars in the case of like fruits and, and, um, and nuts that just naturally store well. You know, some things um, rot really fast. They don't last very long. Some things last a lot longer. <clears throat> so some things that store really well would be most root crops. So most things where you're eating the roots other than radishes um, and turnips to some degree, but most of the other ones can store for a long time. You know, sweet potatoes, potatoes can store for many months. You know, beets, carrots can store for usually again, several months really, if they're stored well. Um, <clears throat> whereas, you know, stuff like lettuce and spinach, not gonna last very long. Um, <clears throat> when the, the, in the realm of, of fruit, things like apples and pears store much longer than peaches. Peaches go bad really quickly. They're really soft, they bruise really easy. Um, so, you know, apples and pears can store a long time. And I'm actually gonna talk about how long in a, in a, in a a couple slides here because it's it's really surprising, especially if you pick varieties that are specifically bred for it. So, um, you know, apples and pears in general store longer than things like peaches and plums and apricots. But even within apples, there's varieties that have been bred specifically to store. So generally speaking, the later in the year an apple or a pear ripens, the longer it will store after it's picked. I don't really know why, but that is that's generally the case. So some really late producing apples that also do well here would be Enterprise and Gold Rush, and they can store for many, 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 many months if you give them the right conditions. If you're looking at, you know, if you really like uh, summer squash, stuff like zucchini, patty pan, crookneck, uh, they tend to, to rot relatively quickly, but a summer squash like Trombencino squash can actually store a much longer time. Um, and then moshata squash species, which are things like butternut um, or seminole pumpkin, store much longer than peepo type squash. So things like acorn squash, spaghetti squash, acorn spaghetti squash um, just don't store as long as butternuts and seminole pumpkins. And then there are varieties in the vegetable world, at least, um, that you will find that are usually either called winter or storage varieties that were that are, are old traditional varieties that were bred by peasants, um, you know, over many hundreds of years to 
to be stored, like to be the food for winter. So you'll see that with, with mostly cool season crops. So things like winter radishes, there's winter kohlrabi, there's winter beets, there's storage cabbage, um, there's even storage tomatoes, um, which are ones that we're doing a big variety trial of this year to try and find ones that are particularly good. But I, I've actually grown those before and they are, they're wild. You pick them like right before the first frost and you stick them in your basement and they just kind of hang out for several months. Um, and so there are these varieties that were bred for that. And so seeking those out and growing them is another way to, um, to be sustainable, not only in the fact that it makes it easier for you to eat the food, but also by being able to eat produce from your garden later into the winter or just later in the season than you would normally be able to, means that you're not having to buy food that is trucked in many thousands of miles, which is usually where our produce is coming from, is many thousands of miles away. <clears throat> and then again, this one seems obvious, but actually harvest the crops. Um, this is, you know, something that we all intend to do, but it can get away from us. So, you know, you get broccoli or whatever, you can keep harvesting broccoli, the little side shoots of broccoli, basically until the plant dies. But usually at some point we get tired and we don't, and we let them go to flower. And that's not the end of the world, but, you know, just staying on top of that, you can get more food. The same with pole beans. So those beans um, that do grow big, long, and viney, um, if you keep picking them, or you know, okra, if you keep picking it, it will keep producing. Whereas if you if you kind of get lazy on picking and you stop picking, a lot of times the production will slow down or even stop because the plant will then switch into ripening those seeds as opposed to producing new pods. So then, you know, another critical part of this, especially if we're talking about growing things that will store longer so that we're not having to buy food that's trucked in, um, which again, uses just, just lots of energy. I mean, most of our produce is coming from either California or Florida or Mexico or even further afield. You know, in the middle of winter, we're getting produce from Chile um, and the Eastern hemisphere all over the place. So, um, the longer we can store food, the less of that that we need to be trucking in, which is a win for the environment. So storing food well once we harvest it is another key way to make that food last longer, um, to give us more time to, to actually eat it and utilize it before it goes bad. And a great example of how big of a difference proper storage can give you is the apple. So fruit respires. So just like we do where we like breathe in, you know, um, oxygen and then breathe out CO2. Fruit, once it's removed from the plant actually does that too. It's actually in a state of basically decomposition, but it happens, you know, very, very slow. It's not like rotting automatically, <clears throat> but the hotter it is, the faster that happens. So the faster it goes from good to bad, the warmer it is. And it doesn't have to be super hot. So as you can see here, fruit respires <clears throat> 10 times faster at 60 degrees, which is still pretty cool. I mean, like that's, you know, cooler than most homes, I would assume, um, than it does at 32 degrees. <clears throat> so, you know, if you, if basically what that means is if you have an apple that at 60 degrees is going to start going bad in three days, it will take um, 30 days if it's kept at 32 degrees. So, I mean, you know, you can increase the storage time by, by 10 times. I mean, that's huge. Um, <clears throat> and I did experiment with this with the Enterprise and Gold Rush apples, which are some of the best storing apples that we have that also grow well here. And I, there's some stuff you can find online. I modified a chest freezer. Uh, it's actually much easier than it sounds. You basically just buy this little contraption that you plug into the wall and then you plug the chest freezer into it. Um, and it will, and you can just set whatever temperature you want. And so I set it to 31 degrees because apples actually don't freeze at 32 degrees because they have so much sugar in them. Um, so I put them at 31 degrees so that they'd be right around that 32 degree um, mark and had them in a chest freezer. It used shockingly little electricity because it's insulated to the point, you know, th with, the, with the assumption that it's gonna be down at like zero degrees, you know, where people usually keep chest freezers. Um, but since you're keeping it 32 degrees, it's, it's really hardly running at all. I think it was using like 50 watts a day when I, when I was monitoring it a while ago. 
but I packed that thing full of Enterprise and Gold Rush apples in October of 2021. I ate the last Enterprise apple, like the last one that was good, in September of 2022. So almost a full year, those Enterprise were good in that chest freezer. And I ate the last Gold Rush apple February, like, like two months ago, February of 2023. So it lasted for, you know, well over a year, <clears throat> you know, what, what would that be? 14, 15 months um, that it stayed good. And this is one here, you know, and it, and it doesn't look, you know, not one that you'd probably buy at the grocery store, but although the outside was just a little soft, like you could still, I, you could still bite into it. It was still crisp. It was still crunchy. It was just the skin was starting to, to pucker a little bit on it. Um, it wasn't bad. It didn't taste bad. It tasted just like an apple. So, you know, storing food and produce at, um, in an ideal setting can really help lengthen that period. So for most produce, cooler is better, but also you want it to be humid. So refrigerators are great, but refri the, just the process of refrigeration, like how the refrigerators stay cool, also really dries them out which is why if you ever put a vegetable just like loose on a shelf, it'll eventually like shrivel up and get crispy because it's, it's basically dehydrating in there. So that is why crisper drawers are a thing. That's why they make vegetable drawers is because by being enclosed, it helps contain the humidity. So putting your produce into a crisper drawer or a piece of Tupperware or just like a plastic grocery bag can, can help maintain that humidity and really help your produce last a lot longer. Kind of some of the exceptions to these are some of the more tropical things. So things like tomatoes, basil, um, peppers, and eggplants don't like to be in the fridge. Um, they can actually start rotting faster if they're in the fridge in some circumstances. So, um, so keeping them cooler, so you know a cooler spot in your kitchen, don't like stick them right over your stove or something, um, but like kind of a cooler, darker, place in your kitchen, but not the refrigerator. That's um, generally speaking too cold. <clears throat> and then kind of one of the last pieces of this first, you know, kind of topic we're touching on um, is just that to eat everything you can. Um, and we actually have kind of a whole class on this that we did last year that there's a video of up on our YouTube that I'm going to link to in the description on the YouTube page if you want to check that out. Um, <clears throat> but it's important to know what is edible, which again, seems like, yeah, I know what's edible, but there's a lot of stuff that we don't commonly eat on our vegetables that, that are also edible. And in some instances are actually the main dish in other cultures. <clears throat> and so just a couple examples of that, um, of things that maybe you didn't know were edible is if you're growing horseradish, um, generally, we think of the horseradish root as the part that is edible, and that is the part that is most commonly consumed, but the leaves are also edible and taste like horseradish, so they're real good, kind of chopped up and put on a salad. Um, if you're growing fava beans <clears throat> or peas, the leaves of those, both edible, and pea shoots, which is, and this is, these are some that I harvested right here, so just that, you know, top inch or so of a growing pea plant are really good. Like they're really tender. They taste just like peas. Um, and so like for me, I grow peas as a winter cover crop in my garden. And so this time of year in my beds where I'm uh, not planting uh, spring crops, where I'm planting my summer stuff, I just let these grow and I just harvest like big old bundles of pea shoots all spring long until I'm ready to rip them out and plant some tomatoes. Um, this one is one that some people will disagree with me on, but uh, tomato greens, the leaves, are edible. Um, you know, everybody thinks tomato greens are poisonous, and in large doses, I'm sure that's true, but um, both tomato and pepper leaves can be used in small amounts, like in pestos or things like that, um, and you can find recipes online. I wouldn't, you know, make like a big salad out of them and eat that all the time, but um, kind of in small amounts, um, you can use them like in pestos and stuff, and they have a really good flavor. If you're growing grapes, the leaves are edible. It's what dolmas are made out of. Um, sweet potato leaves are not only edible, but are in, in some cultures, that's the main thing that you eat and the roots get thrown to the pigs. Um, they're actually quite good um, and they're really nutritious. They have 
a antioxidant in them called lutein. It's like the highest source known of lutein, which is an antioxidant that's actually sold as a supplement because it's really good for your eyes, apparently. And this is like one of the only dietary sources of it. And again, they're just real good. They're, they're surprisingly mild and they're pretty tender for um, a summer green. And so like you can eat them raw, like they're tender enough to do that. The flavor is a little strong for what most people like for raw greens, but just wilted a little bit, or cooked, uh, they taste great. Uh, if you're growing sesame, which is, you know, like sesame seeds that you can grow, it's also planted a lot as an ornamental. Um, the leaves of those are also edible and are consumed in Korea as like a spice pretty regularly. Squash leaves and shoots and blossoms are all edible. Every part of all brassicas. So, you know, if you're growing broccoli, the leaves are also edible because broccoli is the exact same species as collards. Um, same, you know, with the leaves of um, cauliflower and cabbage and kohlrabi and, you know, all of those, all of those things are edible. Uh, the flowers of herbs are all edible and usually taste kind of like the herb. If you are growing nasturtiums, which is a common flower, you can eat the greens, the leaves, the flowers, and the pods, which are actually pickled and turned into capers. So this is a picture down here of the pods. They're also called poor man's capers sometimes. Uh, the flowers of daylilies, as well as the green shoots when they're first coming up in the spring are edible and are a commercial crop in some areas of East Asia. If you're growing radishes, um, if you get some that you were not able to harvest the roots, you know, if you missed that and they started bolting, now the roots kind of woody, you can let them flower and then produce pods and you can eat the pods. And the pods taste just like radishes. And these are what the pods look like. And so, you know, one of those where, you know, if you missed it, you didn't get the harvest in in time, you can still actually get some food out of it. And the, the greens of radishes are also edible. The scapes of garlic, so the kind of curly cue thing that'll come out of the top of some garlic, and then garlic and elephant garlic greens, like the leafy parts on top. And cilantro, if you're growing cilantro, um, you can pull it up at the end of the year when it starts bolting and you're, you're kind of done with it, and you can eat the roots. Um, and the roots just taste like cilantro. You know, wash them and stuff first. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, there's always going to be some stuff that you end up that you cannot eat. So how do we kind of utilize that or um, reuse that in a way that is um, hopefully beneficial or at least less destructive to our environment? And one of the biggest ways, assuming you don't have livestock, if you have livestock, feed it to them. But assuming you don't have livestock, one of the single most impactful things you can do to reduce your household waste is to compost. Um, like it's shockingly big. Nearly 40% of all food in the US is never eaten, as I mentioned earlier. By weight, 61% of all municipal solid waste is stuff that can be composted, 61%. Um, and food is the single largest component of waste that goes to landfills. 25% um, of the volume of landfills is food. And that's, I don't know, absolutely wild to me. And then paper and paper products, which are also compostable, make up an additional 11% of landfill volume. So over a third of landfills are stuff that can just be composted. And, you know, the problem with that from an environmental standpoint, other than the fact that like all the energy and materials and everything that went into that food, it was completely wasted because we didn't even eat it and trucking it to you and all of that, totally wasted. Um, but also then there's energy used to truck that to the landfill and then it gets thrown in the landfill. And for the most part, when it ends up in the landfill, it turns into methane. And landfills are estimated to produce about 11% of all methane emissions in the world. And to date, methane is responsible for 30% of all of the warming that we have had since the Industrial Revolution. And so it's a pretty significant piece of, um, of climate change is, is methane. Um, and a part of that is landfills. And most of the methane coming from landfills is food um, that could be composted.
or just not thrown away in an ideal world. So just a quick thing, and again, we have a whole class on composting where we dive into this um, that we actually, I think, just did two weeks ago. So that is brand new and up on our YouTube, and I'll link to that as well in the description so you guys can watch that. But just a quick kind of rundown of what you can compost if you're wanting to compost at home. So kind of the easiest things to compost if you're new to it and kind of the things that are the easiest way to get started is any fruit and vegetable scraps that you're not going to eat can get composted. Uh, any weeds, any garden plants, and there's a couple addendums to that that I'll talk about in the next slide, but any weeds, any garden plants, tree leaves, grass clippings, eggshells, hair, and that's like human hair, but also like pet hair, if you've got a pet that you're brushing and sheds a lot, <laughs> like I do, um, and coffee grounds are all very easy and good to compost. And then uh, other things that are possible to compost, but you need to be a little bit more careful with or, you know, are, are better to like, once you're comfortable composting, you can start experimenting with. But other things that you can compost and I compost include cooked food. You can do that. I wouldn't throw, you know, massive amounts of it, but if you're just kind of cleaning your plate, it's fine. Grains, bread, um, rotten food. Again, if it's like real, real nasty, um, maybe don't throw it in your compost because it could make your compost get kind of smelly for a while small amounts of dairy and animal products. So again, if you're like cleaning off your plate, that's fine. You know, if you've got like 10 pounds of beef that went bad in your fridge, first of all, what's happening at your house. Um, but you know, if that happens, probably don't put that in your compost because that's going to be, be kind of a mess. But you know, if you're just scraping off little bits of fat from your plate or there was eggs in the cake that you're throwing away or something like that, that's okay. Paper. Uh, paper napkins, paper towels, coffee filters, um, theoretically natural fiber fabric, although practically that one's kind of hard to do, but like burlap could be actually. Um, wood ashes, if it's from like wood and not charcoal briquettes. Uh, manure from herbivores, so like if you have rabbits or, um, you know, I don't know, guinea pigs or something like that. Um, chicken bedding, like the straw and stuff from chickens. Pet hair, which I mentioned, uh, actually even like your fingernail clippings can be fine. And then if you get starch packing peanuts, like sometimes you'll get those packing peanuts that will just literally dissolve in water and that's just 100% starch. So you can throw those in there as well if you want. And then more important than what you can compost, I think is talking about some of the things that you cannot compost that might that are a little tricky. So one is dryer lint. Um, dryer lint is one that you'll see a lot of people say you can compost and if we all had 100% natural fiber clothes, then absolutely you could. But because the vast majority of clothing in the United States is now made out of plastic, um, basically what dryer lint is, is a big old ball of microplastics. So if you throw that into your compost, um, it will for the most part disappear. Like you won't see, oh, here's a big old clump of lint, but basically it's just dispersed. You know, those millions of microplastics are just now mixed in with your compost and they're never gonna break down because they're plastic. So dry, and that's also why dryer lint makes an excellent fire starter is that it's basically a big old ball of petroleum. <clears throat> uh, the other one, which is very annoying is disposable plastic and paper products that say compostable. Um, so when you see those things where it's like, you know, a paper cup, that holds you know, liquid because it's a cup and says 100% compostable, that's not compostable, in, except for in very rare circumstances when you're talking about your backyard compost because for it to hold water, that lining on the inside is plastic. It might be a biodegradable plastic, but it's not a biodegradable plastic that's gonna break down in your compost bin. And that's almost always, you'll see a little asterisk next to where it says compostable and then little text somewhere that says in an industrial composting facility. Um, and, you're, and you're not an industrial composting facility. So for the most part, compostable plastic is a lie um, for the most part. So uh, mostly just designed to make us feel better about buying plastic. So uh, that's not really ever compostable in your backyard compost, unless it's something that's like very specific that you've like looked into that has like certified that it is compostable in backyard composts. Like um, those like phone case, Pila phone cases I know, like I had one a while ago and they're like very clear on their website that they've done testing in like backyard compost bins. Um, and so like in those circumstances, 
give it a shot. Um, but when it just says like compostable, I wouldn't trust that. If it looks like plastic, it is. Another one that's a little tricky is tea bags. So most of the, the bag material, like on almost all companies, I think there's one or two that are exceptions, but virtually all of those, the, um, the kind of netting material is, is plastic. It's a synthetic material. So you could like rip those open and the tea leaves inside are compostable, but the actual bag is not. Um, and then I wouldn't add plant materials that have been treated with an herbicide because those herbicides are probably not gonna decompose enough in the compost for that compost to then be safe to apply to your plants. Um, uh, I wouldn't add any treated wood or treated wood sawdust or treated wood ash, or which I mean, you shouldn't burn treated wood, but anything like that. And then I wouldn't add ashes from charcoal briquettes because charcoal briquettes are not actually charcoal, like from wood, they're made from coal coke. Um, so they're pretty high in heavy metals. Um, if it's like true charcoal, like hardwood charcoal, that's fine to add. Um, but if it's like charcoal briquettes, I wouldn't add those. And then definitely do not add any human waste or manure from any meat eating animals. So especially things like cats and dogs, there's a lot of disease, um, disease dangers with that. And then I said in the last slide that you can add weeds um, to your compost and you can, but generally speaking, I wouldn't add any weeds that are like really aggressive if there is like seeds or rhizome on it. So, you know, if you've got a bunch of Bermuda grass, you know, that you pulled up and it's got the big long roots and you throw that in your compost, that's not gonna kill it. Um, so I wouldn't add things like that. And then if you have a crop that was diseased, like there was like a really nasty disease that came in and killed your tomatoes, I would not compost those tomato plants. Because again, for most backyard composting operations, you're not gonna be getting hot enough to kill that disease. So that I would, I would get rid of in some, other, in some other way. So then going into some other things you can do, and this is just a one slide thing, but saving your own seeds is a great thing to do. Um, it's actually a lot easier than it seems. Um, and there's some crops like tomatoes that saving seeds is like very, virtually no work. Basically when you cut open your tomato, you just scoop the seeds out, boom, you save tomato seeds. Um, but again, we have a whole class on that as well that I'll link in our description, um, talking about all the different um, crops that you can save seed from, what you need to know about the different ones, but it is a lot easier than it, um, than it seems to at least get started. So now we're gonna move into some other things. <clears throat> so, you know, kind of starting with seeds, you got your seeds one way or another. Um, and then a lot of us will grow seedlings. So if you are growing seedlings or growing your, uh, your plants in containers, if you're a container gardener, that kind of by definition for the most part necessitates a seed starting mix or a potting mix and a container. And there's two big problems with this, the container and the potting mix. <clears throat> so the containers are usually plastic, which I think most of us probably know isn't great for the environment um, and just isn't really a great material a lot of times. And the soil, for the most part, soil is generally not actually soil, it's generally peat moss, which is essentially a mined material that is in the process of becoming coal. It's kind of a fossil fuel. It's not actually a fossil fuel, but it's like in the process of becoming one. And it is like literally mined. This is a picture of um, of a peat bog that's being mined. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure where, but you can see they are bogs. They're very wet. You can see this area. This is like the, the natural landscape here. You can see all these like pool water, very wet. And to get the peat moss, they have to drain this area. And then they literally just come and they scrape all of this off. Um, and remove it. So there, so there's a lot of destruction to that ecosystem for sure. But there's other problems that we will we will get to with peat as well as what you can do instead. But first, containers. So <clears throat> there are uh, non-plastic options for sure. There are terracotta and ceramic pots, which are probably the best option, but are very expensive if you're wanting to grow a lot of stuff. Um, and they're heavy, like there's there's definitely limitations, but they are probably the most sustainable. They're kind of infinitely reusable. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it's a natural material. It's not toxic. 
Um, whenever, if it breaks or whenever it's done, disposal is pretty easy because it's just, it's clay. Like you can, you yeah. could just throw it in a ditch. Don't do that. But like you could do that and it's not toxic. It's not going to like contaminate anything. Um, but that's an option, but, but generally pretty expensive. There are also fiber pots, which um, I feel like are, are pretty popular, mostly because they're kind of marketed as a relatively cheap alternative to plastic. <clears throat> there are some that are made out of like paper or like recycled paper or coir, which is a coconut waste product. Or there's ones called poo pots, which are made out of um, like cow manure. It's like sterilized and everything. It's safe, but it's made out of cow manure. So those options are nice for a couple of reasons. So they are biodegradable, which, you know, plastic is not. So like at the end of its life, it will break down and go away. It's not going to contaminate anything, but they're not reusable. You have to keep buying these. Um, if you're, if it's like a pre-made pot, you have to keep purchasing these every year to grow your seedlings. There are some DIY options that you can make yourself from recycled materials. So it's much cheaper in that regard, but then you have to make them every year, which if you're growing a lot of seedlings can be a lot of work, but there's ways to make them out of like newspaper or, you know, other paper or toilet paper rolls. Um, you can find lots of instructions online and those all work um, pretty well, but again, are not reusable. So you're going to need to keep, keep doing that. There are also peat-based fiber pots, which I put in a separate category because they do have the benefits of, um, it's not gonna contaminate anything in the way that like plastic is, but they actually don't break down. Peat doesn't actually really decompose. Um, Cause again, it, it's kind of like in the process of becoming coal. It's really pretty stable. And that's one of the reasons why um, if you've ever had peat pots and they'll say on there that you can just stick it in the ground, don't do that. Cause they usually don't really break down all that much. Um, and so it can be hard for the roots to poke through uh, the pot. Um, so sometimes it's fine, but a lot of times uh, there's issues with that. And so they don't really break down and they aren't sustainable. Cause again, peat is actually not a renewable resource in a, in a human um, time scale at least. And there's other problems with peat. And then there's fiber pellets. So that's what these are. They come in these little smash pellets and you water them and they puff up. Um, so they're similar to fiber pots. Uh, some of them are made out of coir, which is great. Most of them though are made out of peat and we don't like peat. Um, and the other thing that again, usually is not talked about is they're held together with this little mesh material. That mesh is plastic. Like you can look up on their websites. Um, so like you, you, you actually shouldn't stick that whole thing in the ground because that net is just going to hang out there. It's again, it's not going to decompose. It might break into smaller pieces into little microplastics, but it's not actually going to degrade because it's, because it's plastic. And then of course there is plastic, which unfortunately tends to actually be the best option for a lot of people because they can be reused a lot. Um, using plastic as something that you buy every year and throw away is definitely not a good option. But if you if you have nice heavy duty plastic pots, which if you're a gardener, you almost certainly end up with a lot, whether you like them or not, from buying plants at nurseries. And so reusing those pots, you can reuse them for really a long time. Um, and so that is a much better option. If you've got them anyways, reusing them is better than buying new anything. Um, at least as long as uh, you have those. And then there's kind of the, the wild card. So you can also maybe not have containers. So another alternative or a supplement for reused containers um, is what are called soil blocks. So they require no containers. You just have to buy this metal tool like this and you literally, and you, there's like a, a technique to it, but you basically just smash a bunch of wet um, seed starting mix or potting soil into it and then you press it out and you get these little cubes and you plant your seeds into there and they actually hold together pretty well. So you might not even need pots at all if you're willing to try um, soil blocks. So if you want to kind of sidestep that whole what kind of container do you need, um, maybe check out soil blocks. But then the question is what what soil to use. So as I've been alluding to, seed starting and potting mixes are not exactly sustainable. Um, they are not soil, and they are primarily made of a mixture of peat, perlite, and vermiculite. 
all three of those materials are mined non-renewable resources and none of them are produced locally. Um, peat, the, like the most local source of peat is Northern Canada, so not very close. The closest source for perlite is Arizona and the closest source for vermiculite is Georgia. But we're not necessarily, like if, when you go to the store, you're not necessarily getting it from those most local sources. I think perlite, I was seeing most of the sources in the US are, are out west, like Arizona is the closest one to us and all the other ones are like California, Oregon, Nevada. And so east of the Mississippi, oftentimes perlite is actually getting shipped in from Greece because somehow in our ridiculous world, that makes sense from a money standpoint um, to ship stuff from Greece instead of from Arizona. Uh, and all of them require a lot of energy to produce and ship. And then peat also has some unique sustainability issues. So peat necessitates the addition of a wetting agent and is very acidic. So even though it's naturally in those bogs, like I showed you in that picture, once you dry it, it doesn't want to get wet again, which is why if you've ever had a potted plant that you dry, that gets really dry and then you put water on and the water just sits on top, that's because it's made of peat. And once peat is dry, it doesn't want to get wet again. So they add these special chemicals to it to try and help it absorb water, but eventually those compounds break down um, and you end up with the same problem. And it's also very acidic, like a pH of like three to four, like very, very acidic. And so they also need to add lime or some other pH buffering agent to bring the pH up to closer to six so that plants don't just die when you grow it in there. So it's not actually all that great as being used as a potting mix, but also it turns out that peat bogs are absolutely enormous carbon sinks and harvesting the peat for all of our potting soils um, kind of destroys them. So peat bogs currently only cover about 3% of the world's land surface, and yet they are estimated to hold about 30% of all soil carbon on planet Earth. So they are pretty heavy hitters in terms of holding soil carbon. And so if, if we're disrupting this 3%, it's, um, it's off-gassing a lot of, of CO2. And it's estimated that damaged peat bogs, and not all of peat bog damage is from harvesting for potting soils, by any stretch. But the damaging of peat bogs annually accounts for about 6% of all human greenhouse gas emissions. So again, you know, 6% doesn't sound like a whole lot, but, um, but that can add up pretty quick. There's some debate as to whether Canadian peat harvesting is sustainable, um, but it's a little hard to know for sure. And we have a good replacement. For, like there's other things that we can make potting mixes out of. There's some things out there that peat, there isn't really a good replacement for, but for potting mixes and seed starting mixes, we have good replacements. And those two big replacements are coir and bark. So coir is a waste product. Um, that's what this picture is up here. It's a waste product from coconut manufacturing or not manufacturing, processing. So it can be sold loose, like in a loose fluffy material. They can also compress it like a lot into these solid bricks or pellets, um, and also make them into pots and trays as a replacement for peat pots and peat trays and peat pellets. It's an agricultural waste product, so much more sustainable. It would be like thrown away or burned um, otherwise. It is not hard to get wet and it's not acidic, so it doesn't need those additional um, compounds uh, to make it better as a potting mix, so it makes it easier to make your own potting mixes. Uh, and it's really kind of the best one-for-one -one replacement, but we don't really grow coconuts around here. So it is still needing to travel a pretty long distance, which isn't ideal, but uh, its production and manufacture is much less um, energy and carbon intensive than these mined minerals that also, I didn't mention this, need to be heated to extreme degrees. Like perlite literally needs to be popped like popcorn. Like they need to bring it to like, I don't know, a thousand or several thousand degrees Fahrenheit to get it to to actually like pop and make that kind of puffy white beads that look like styrofoam. The other alternative that's one that I'm much more interested in recently is bark. So this is something that they've been doing a lot more research on in Europe um, than we've been doing here. Um, but there are more products that are becoming available using bark or forest forestry waste, I think is what it's called sometimes as well but it's, it's waste from the timber industry. It's the bark that they strip off to make uh, lumber. 
Uh, it's produced locally, not super locally, but like Southern Missouri um, and, and into Arkansas, Tennessee, there are, you know, lumber mills down there. Um, <clears throat> Fox Farm is probably the best spot, uh, best place to find like a, a low peat potting mix that's bagged that does have bark in it, but it does still have some peat, unfortunately. And actually, if you want to make your own um, potting mix, which I'll talk about in the next couple slides, um, you can buy pine fines, which is the best bark material to use from St. Louis Composting. Rice hulls are also a great alternative for perlite, um, and compost is a good addition to hold moisture, which is what vermiculite is mostly used for. And then, like I mentioned, Fox Farm is a great place to find some like pre-bagged mixes that are more sustainable. They still have some peat, but they're more sustainable than most others. Uh, St. Louis Composting is a great place to get compost, um, as well as bark to make your own um, mixes. And Hummert International, which is another local um, company up in Earth City, sells rice hulls, which is a good alternative for perlite. So if you want to make your own, this is a recipe, and I'm not going to go too much into it, because um, I'm going to send this out to everybody, but this is a good recipe um, for if you want to do soil blocks. This is well tested for soil blocks. Um, this is what I currently use for pots. I think this would also work for pots, but this is what I have used, so I know that this works well in pots down here. Then some other sustainable stuff um, that we can look at is, is water. Water is, you know, an important thing to be using wisely. If you're doing irrigation, using things like drip irrigation or soaker hoses are more efficient. I would also encourage you to collect rainwater, especially if, you know, you're talking about gardening at your, at your home where you have a roof to collect water off of. And it doesn't have to be fancy. Like I have even done it with, I had like a kiddie pool that I was using to grow water chestnuts in a couple of years ago. And I just stuck it under a downspout and like, let it fill up with water. Um, and I, you know, filled a watering can up with the kiddie pool. Like it doesn't have to be real fancy. You can stick a trash can under a leaking gutter or something. Like there's lots of ways to collect rainwater. And then mulch, more mulch and even more mulch is really, really great. And I think very undervalued in the vegetable garden, especially adding mulch. And that can, and that doesn't need to be like purchased mulch, but like any dead plant material, whether that's dead weeds or straw or leaves from your trees in the fall, they just any dead plant material over the soil surface is going to keep your soil cooler, which is going to reduce evaporation, and it's going to reduce stress on your plants so they don't need as much water in the first place. And then creating a healthy ecosystem, and this is what we're going to spend kind of the rest of the night talking about. So we generally think of the micro world, kind of, um, you know, microorganisms, bacteria, fungus, nematodes, things like that as bad. Um, and there are bad ones that cause disease, but there are many, 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 many more that don't cause any disease at all or actually are beneficial to our plants. <clears throat> um, and microorganisms in the soil and on the leaf and stem tissue of our plants can actually make plants more healthy, resilient, and less prone to infection by disease organisms. And in some instances, even insect predation, which is wild. <clears throat> so a couple things um, that can help with your soil microbiome. So keeping the bacteria, the fungi, the nematodes, the worms, the arthropods, all those things in the soil, uh, healthy and happy and not killing them, which is what a lot of conventional gardening techniques do, is to aerate your soil without tilling. Tillers are really some of the most destructive tools when it comes to the life in soil. You know, you think about it, it's this like, you know, big motorized thing that has these blades that are spinning through the soil. How, in, like, if a worm gets caught in that, do you think there is literally any chance at all that that worm is going to survive? Because the answer is no. Um, you're literally slicing up all of the worms, all of the fungi in the soil. It really obliterates all soil life except bacteria. And bacteria is what weeds really, really like. Um, and so in terms of aerating your soil, which can still be important, the best way to do that without destroying the the beneficial life in your soil is to use a broad fork, which is what this tool is here, or a digging fork, or even just a shovel, and just sticking them in the ground and kind of leaning back and doing that where it kind of lifts and cracks the soil, but you're not pulverizing and mixing the soil. You don't, you don't want to pulverize and mix the soil. You just want to kind of lift and crack the soil. You also want to add organic matter, because when there are not plants growing in 
your soil, the like so the so those microorganisms are living off the sugars that the plants release from their roots. Plants actually release a lot of sugars and proteins from their roots to feed these organisms in the soil. And when the plants aren't there, whenever you know it's the winter or the middle of summer and you're not growing something or something like that, uh, it's the organic matter in the soil that keeps those beneficial organisms alive. The best way to increase organic matter is to add compost. Like an inch or two every spring should be more than enough and just apply it to the surface. You do not need to till it in. The worms and the microorganisms will actually mix it in for you over the growing season. <clears throat> if you are broad forking or aerating your soil, what I like to do is you do that first and then you add your compost on top and then you just kind of use a hard rake and it will smooth it out and make a nice um, fluffy top just like tilling will without causing all of the destruction. And then add mulch to your beds. It is also very helpful for the microorganisms. And then, you know, always have something growing as much as possible, because again, those plants are releasing sugars and proteins from their roots that are going to keep these beneficial organisms alive, that are going to help your crops when you're growing them. So it's a it's a win-win situation. And also those microorganisms help with, in ways that we don't really have time to talk about, with actually also increasing how much water your soil can hold and preventing runoff, which helps with, you know, stormwater runoff, which is a big environmental problem in St. Louis, especially. And also just again, so that you don't have to be watering as much, which is always nice. And then lastly, compost teas. So this is literally just, you take some compost, you let it sit in water, not for like five minutes, like not for very long. And you kind of like stir it aggressively or kind of massage it if it's in like a bag or something. And it releases all of these humic and fulvic acids, like the water will turn kind of a black chocolatey kind of color. Um, but all of those bacteria and fungi and stuff are also getting into that water. And then if you use a watering can to sprinkle that around, you're kind of inoculating all of your soil with all of those microorganisms that were in that compost. And then last, beneficial insects and wildlife. Um, so to benefit the insects and wildlife that we have here, all of our native insects and birds and other things that um, are, are honestly a lot of times helpful in the garden. And even if they're not, they're still important for, you know, many other reasons. But some of the most important ways to do that, which I'm going to touch on briefly on all of these, is to have a diverse mix of as many native plants as reasonable in your space. Um, and then aim for blooming for as many weeks of the year as possible. And again, ideally of native plants blooming as many weeks out of the year as possible. Having access to water, um, creating overwintering habitat and nesting habitat. So water, um, this is like literally just like providing water for wildlife. Um, you know, a lot of times we, we don't want standing water around for good reasons. We don't want mosquitoes and, you know, nasty stuff all over the place. But because our, um, we've created these, these environments with really no water around, what are the insects supposed to drink when we have a drought? What are the frogs supposed to live in? So there are some plants, native plants, that kind of deal with this. So cup plant is one. Um, these big plants and the, these leaves grow like a little cup so that they actually collect water. And you'll see sometimes frogs hanging out in there because it's a little wet haven for them, but also insects. Bees and stuff can come and get a drink. But um, because we don't probably want just a bunch of stagnant water standing around, I'm not recommending just like setting out a bowl of water to get nasty. But if you get like a little solar powered little fountain or something like that, which can be pretty and enjoyable in your space, but also having that um, and keeping the water moving will help avoid mosquitoes or any other undesirable things. And it can be really valuable for our local insects and wildlife in a drought. Um, and it can also, believe it or not, actually help reduce bird and mammal damage to tomatoes and fruit in the summer, because sometimes, especially when it's really dry, they're not eating your tomatoes because they love tomatoes. They're eating your tomatoes because they're wet. Um, they need water is, is the primary reason why they're, why they're doing it. And the same with, with fruit, um, like peaches, a lot of times where you'll get peck damage from birds, they're, they're actually pecking them to get at the water. They're not wanting to eat the fruit. I mean, they, they're eating the fruit, obviously. But having that can also help you with that problem to some degree. And then overwintering and nesting habitat. So leaves, uh, leave your leaves. So when your leaves fall from uh, the trees, ideally don't, you know, mulch them up and bag them up and like burn them or get rid of them. 
uh, use them somewhere as mulch. As I've been talking about, put them on your beds or put them around your perennials. They are amazing mulch, which helps with so many different things. And one of the things that also helps with is there are some native insects and amphibians and things like that that will overwinter, like that they need those leaves, that leaf litter, which would naturally be here to survive the winter. That insulation, that warmth that those leaves provide is how they survive our cold winters. And so if we remove all of the leaves from everywhere, then they don't have anywhere to overwinter and then they're not gonna be here in the spring. Uh, on the other end of the extreme, a lot of our native bees actually overwinter in the soil and they need bare ground to get to the soil. If you've got, you know, six inches of leaves, they can't get through those leaves to actually dig a hole into the soil. So also having some areas of bare soil can be can be useful. So if you have some areas that, you know, you do want to keep nice and clear, um, that can also actually be beneficial for uh, our native bees. And then um, many bees lay eggs in stems. So this is something that's been getting more attention recently, which is good. Um, so if you have any native plants that are growing, it's best to not cut them down in the fall to let them stand um, until the spring. But what I've actually recently learned from some bee researchers that we work with is actually if you cut them down in April, you're still actually probably not helping them all that much um, because a lot of them actually will overwinter, like the female will overwinter. And then in the spring, she lays her eggs in the stem. And so if you then cut down all the stems and like burn them or throw them in the yard waste, then you've thrown away all the eggs. Um, and so what's actually recommended is to cut back the stems, but to leave the bottom like eight to 24 inches, depending on the plants and how much you know works for you, but leaving the stubs. And then as the new growth comes up, you're not even really going to notice those stubs. You know, so you're not leaving the whole big thing. You're just leaving a little bit. And so as the new leaves and stuff come up, they hide it. It's not going to look ugly. Um, and then those bees will have the spring and the summer to hatch and and fly away and do their thing. Um, and then those stems will break down over the summer and the fall. And by next spring, they won't even be there. And you'll just repeat that process again. And this is just a list of some of the native plants that are known to be used as stem habitat. So also if you're looking for some things to plant um, and you wanna create some habitat, there's some native things that you can plant. And a few of them like blackberries, raspberries and elderberries um, are also pretty tasty. And then native planting. So this is the last thing here. So plants with a lot of small flowers um, so things like yarrow, so like over here, where it's, you know, it's like, it looks like one big flower, but if you look at it, it's actually a whole bunch of little tiny flowers are actually more, or they're useful to a broader range of insects than those with like big single flowers. So like Babtisia, gorgeous plant, but like one of these flowers is like about this big, whereas one yarrow flower is like little itty bitty. And the reason for that is that you know, things like bees, which are, you know, specifically designed to get nectar, um, can get into those bigger flowers pretty well. But a lot of other insects that can be particularly useful in your garden, things like predatory wasps or parasitic wasps, um, will eat nectar and pollen when there's not enough other food around. But they're not really, that's not their like primary food source. And so it's much harder for them to get into these big flowers than it is these little tiny ones. So if you want to have kind of the broadest range of, of insect helping, looking for those things that are made up of a lot of little flowers are going to give you the biggest kind of bang for your buck. <clears throat> and again, really, you know, all natives are useful to something. But a couple um, of just notes that we like to mention are, are these here. Um, and in particular, I like to mention the witch hazels. So we actually have two native witch hazels. Um, and witch hazels are famous because they actually bloom in winter, like no leaves on any trees or anything, they bloom. But what's unique about the fact that we have two of them is that one of them blooms like November, December, and the other one blooms like January, February. So if you plant both of these, you really are also getting some blooms, which is also just nice to have in your yard. Um, in kind of the middle of winter, which is which is really nice, and they um, 
they're, they're shrubs, but they are understory shrubs. So you can grow them in shade. They have pretty flowers. They're native. They're going to provide food if we have a warm spell in winter and any you know insects wake up and they need some food. There's going to be some witch hazel there for them, hopefully. Um, so yeah. And then these are our um, upcoming classes and more to come where, you know, we, we don't schedule the whole year at once. So this is, you know, the next couple of months, we've got some um, pretty exciting ones coming up, summer crops and cover crops where we, where we, um, we split our garden and our orchard um, into two separate classes um, where we're, but both of them, we're going to talk about holistic pest and disease control in both of those settings. And then in June 8th, we're going to have a new class on um, designing your own food forest and then in June, when it's nice and hot, we're going to talk about how to keep, um, how to manage water in your garden so that your plants will stay nice and, and happy throughout the summer. So thanks everybody for coming.